to write how to do it, how to promote yourself, how to sell products. Do you know about the art of storytelling? Jocelyn Gumbar, who is head of PR at the United Colours of Benetton in India, gave a fascinating talk on this subject. I mean, I didn't know half of this stuff. Well, I did, but I didn't. And it was so good to hear Jocelyn talk about what we need to consider when putting together a campaign or putting together content. It's about engaging. It's about making promises and delivering on them. She said it's about metaphors and patterns and it's about the psychology of everything that you're doing and in the end Jocelyn gave us her findings to her research paper she says about four components to identify to appreciate coal consumption and ignore now listen to them because it's absolutely fantastic findings so I hope you enjoyed this video and thank you for watching just look at this image really closely there's something really interesting about it. You'd see a lot of black dots inside white dots, but they actually do not exist. So the most important characteristic of storytelling actually is that we see it even when it's not there. Uh, perception doesn't always equal reality. There's a very um, common form of storytelling, and that is called soliloquy. I talk to myself all the time. Brands talk to me all the time. Humans talk to each other all the time. The basic thing is that we talk in the form of stories. Uh, presumerism is a very common phenomenon. It's almost like we break that word into two parts. It's production by consumers. Who are we really selling out our product to? We're selling out our product to a human. It's one human who represents the brand and it's another human who represents the consumer. So it becomes very important for us to actually realize the basics of psychology would go into why a purchase is made, why a perception is formed and why a person likes, advocates or dislikes a brand. These are two uh, areas of brain, Broca's and Warnick's, uh, very fancy again but very important. So these are two areas in the brain which are basically um, a clot that's like a clot of nerves and that's really where the language comprehension happens. So what that tells us is that marketing has to work very deep inherently into metaphors. If you're doing your campaign, really need to invest in time in advertising, really need to invest in time in how we are picking up the smallest of copy. What are the words that we're using in our ad campaigns? What are the words that we're using out for the copy of our Instagram story? What are the words that you're putting out for outdoor? Because all of those words, the moment a consumer is going to see it, he's going to associate those words with the kind of product that you have. Pets understand patterns very well, you know. They understand if they're going to do something which is not right, they're going to get a spank. And if they do something which is good, they're going to get a treat. The patterns that dogs understand and the patterns that humans understand, they're actually very similar. So when you're talking to a dog, you're not talking to him in a language. He never understands your language. He just understands your actions. He just understands the patterns. The pattern is the moment you are wrapping up everything, switching off the lights, going towards the door, he knows that you're going out and he knows maybe you're just leaving him behind and he starts acting cranky. It's actually how consumers work as well. Consumers understand these patterns, you know. They'd buy two products from you and those two products did not turn out well. They'd form a pattern in the mind, you know what, ABC brand is like this. This is what the brand does and this is what I do not like in the brand. And the problem is the moment a consumer forms a pattern in his mind, that's when your word of mouth gets activated. So here's a very fundamental example of um, Coke, Coca-Cola. Um, they launched in 1886. It was, it was just a syrup which was mixed with some sugar. Uh, they were primarily in Atlanta and their first marketing campaign was actually nothing but just a free sampling out in a small market. By the time they reached 1916, they were present in about 20 countries, but all of those countries were selling Coca-Cola in different bottles. What that was doing to them was really bad. They did not have an identity. They did not have a story. 
So the story of Coca-Cola, the experience that I had, the moment I hold a bottle in my hand, was different in every part of the world. That's when they came with a standard bottle. That's when they realized the power of pattern. If you are into marketing, this is one name that I think you should really know. Lothar was actually the person who introduced pop-up books for kids. It was a big breakthrough of that time because he shifted storytelling from being very mundane to being very engaging. Now that's the word, engaging, yes to being very dynamic and attractive to that age. In one of the things Lothar said that, I realize a kid's attention span is very little. And I think that's very similar to kind of consumers that we talk about. Their attention span now is known to be just six seconds on your, on your Facebook, especially your YouTube videos. So he said that I wanted to grab the attention and I just felt that simple static books were not doing that for me. And he created these pop-up books. The content that we are creating for consumers right now is getting too static, is getting too cluttered. So maybe there are ways of how you want to break that monotony with creating new age content, for example, interesting influencer marketing videos. So that's really another way of how you tell your stories, but you make sure that the platform is always interesting and the platform is always engaging for the consumer. There's this one TV channel, if you're browsing a TV, you'd always stop at. Why is that? There is this one shop at a flea market, you're just moving around, strolling around, and you'd stop that. Now this, how much ever trivial sounds to you, has a deep psychological lesson for us. And that lesson is promise. When you are browsing through all of those channels, there is one channel that makes a teeny tiny promise with you, you know what, my content is good, just stop, and you stop. When we are producing content, are we keeping in mind that we are giving out that promise indication to the consumer? Are you making sure that you're grabbing consumers' attention? Because if you're not doing that in the first six seconds, it's just going to be another radio channel that just gets passed on. Why do we find babies and dogs very cute? It's because there is a lot of wonder associated with them. There's a lot of, you, you're intrigued by them. We just assume things. Consumers behave similarly to stories. I was meeting a few of my friends who work at Facebook and you know, I was just trying to understand with them, you know, what is the kind of content that really works very well on Facebook as a medium? And they said that, you know, most of your suspense videos, most of your uh, question mark videos, they just go off the roof. I was talking to a friend of mine who's uh, basically a psychologist, and she said that cartoons are actually a lot of time used as healing mechanism for people who are suffering from depression and a lot of other mental uh, anomalies. That's because when you're looking at cartoons, um, you are into a different world altogether, you know? There's this reason why humans are a lot attracted to video games. We play video games and that's what the researchers and psychologists say because that gives us a chance to go into a different world. And the storytelling actually has to do the similar thing. So this is a statistic, 65% uh, of the conversations that humans have are actually gossips. And, and they're in the form of stories. The thing is, um, maybe brands are not doing that that closing the loop very properly? Are we, are we trying to seed in the curiosity question? And then are we making sure the consumers are coming back to us to get the answers? Are we making sure that the consumers are always interested in what's happening with this brand? What new are they coming up with? And we kind of look into the root and look into the basics and fundamentals of how a human mind works and we take inspiration from that. I think we can really create a lot of, stu a lot of good stuff and a lot of stuff that has greater affinity with consumers. In the end, this is um, something that I took about six months to frame uh, uh, when I wrote my research paper on storytelling. When I talk to you about a snorkeling experience, and if you've done snorkeling, my storytelling and my psychological communication with you is very different. We talk on a narration which is first person. What's happening between the two of us is that we are identifying with each other. When brands do that kind of communication, they create advocates. We go on to the second level, that's appreciation. I say, you know what, 
I did snorkeling. You say, you know what? I haven't done snorkeling yet, but I think it's really cool. I just want to try it sometime. You aren't identifying with what I'm saying, but you're appreciating it. That's because there's there's a sensibility, there's an intellect level where we both stand together on the same stage. Now this is this is very interesting for a particular category of consumers, which is called which is called fence sitters. You know, when you when you do a lot of customer relationship management and loyalty, the dwindling consumers. You know, I am a big fan of Apple, but if I'm getting a good discount, I might switch to Samsung. These are the kind of consumers that marketings are always marketing people are always behind because they actually make a lot of difference. So when you try to do a lot of content which people are able to appreciate your entire um, potential of converting the fence to consumers into your brand increases. The third category is cold consumption. It happens a lot um, to me actually when I see a wrong targeting. You know, you're talking about Huggies, you're talking about Pampers and you're targeting it that ad is targeted to teens. That's a cold consumption, you know. I'm just not interested in that product. That just is not relevant to me. But cold consumption has one bright side. That if it is the right product, it might lead to a potential consumer. And the last thing is ignore. This is actually what's happening with a lot of brands on the YouTube ads, on the Facebook videos, all the time. The most important thing that, you know, I want to um, make in this presentation and, and largely when I say that I want to connect a lot of things that we do in marketing with psychology is every time that you see that you are silent as a brand, that you're not talking to consumer, you're actually talking. That is very important. So even your silence is a perception and is a pattern that the consumer is forming in his mind. This is apparently not very healthy for the brand at all. Wasn't Jaslyn brilliant? I loved her talk. And she had such positive feedback afterwards. And a woman came up to me and said, she's so young. And I said, I know, but absolutely so knowledgeable. Why? Because research. Jocelyn's done the research to back up everything that she was saying. So if you want to know the art of storytelling, I really hope you take on board the four components that Jocelyn said, because only then will you understand and appreciate the psychology behind your buyers, behind your viewers. So I hope you enjoy this video. Please subscribe for more and thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.